Hello, my name is Joe Horn. I am Community Development Director for Williamson County Government, and I'd like to welcome you to Community Development 101. This is one of a series of shows that were put together in conjunction with Mayor Rogers Anderson's office to discuss the aspects of the Community Development Department, which handles uh, development services for the unincorporated county. I have two guests today. Um, first of all, I'm most immediately on my left is Mike Madison, who is the planning director for Williamson County. And on Mike's left is Floyd Heflin. Uh, he is the county engineer. And uh, the important part about this show is we're going to talk about uh, development process, subdivision sp specifically. And these two gentlemen are, are in charge of the different aspects of those reviews. But welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. At any rate, uh, as I notice, is that it's pretty safe to say your respective departments play a large role in the subdivision process. And we've, you know, at some point we'll talk about the planning process, but right now we want to talk a little bit about zoning, subdivisions, and how that factors into what ultimately people see out on the county road. Now, uh, first of all, uh, Williamson County, an incorporated county, is a pretty good sized county, but uh, every piece of property in that uh, in the county is zoned for a specific range of uses, be them commercial or residential or non-residential, and also uh, different areas as well. Uh, Mike, could you talk a little bit about the uh, about the zoning districts and I guess broad terms, focusing yeah. on densities? Sure, I'd be happy to. So, uh, as you mentioned, Joe, the the county is broken into various zoning districts, and each of those zoning districts. Um, have their own set of uses that are allowed, and then also have their own set of development standards, meaning that um, each district will prescribe um, what the density would be, um, what the lot sizes are allowed to be, building setbacks, open space standards, and that sort of thing. Um, the zoning districts are based upon the comprehensive plan. So the comprehensive plan makes a set of recommendations on land use um, and it gets pretty specific in terms of where development of certain types should take place. And so the zoning districts were created to help implement the comprehensive plan. And they've been mapped, as you said, really all across the unincorporated county. Um, the map uh, that you're seeing now is the official zoning map for uh, the county. The, just to orient you, the white is the cities. Uh, the gray areas surrounding the cities are what we call the urban growth boundaries. Those are still in the county until they're annexed, but um, they've been identified by the cities as future municipal mm -hmm. areas. And then the rest of it is just unincorporated uh, rural county. So what I'll do is I'll just kind of real briefly um, go through the various zoning districts that Please. are applied and let people see kind of where they're located. So the first one is the Rural Preservation One Zoning District. Um, that's an area that's applied to several, four or five different uh, sub areas in the western part of the county. Um, this is a zoning district that allows a maximum residential density of one unit per acre. It's primarily a, re primarily a residential zoning district and an agricultural zoning district. Uh, and then also in the western side, uh, in the dark green, is the Rural Preservation 5. The, the majority of the western portion of the county is zoned uh, this zoning district, which allows a maximum density of one unit per five acres. So it's a lower density uh, zoning district, again, um, allowing a combination of <clears throat> excuse me, residential and agricultural uses. Then on the eastern side, the light green represents the Rural Development One Zoning District, a one unit per acre zoning district. Dark green uh, is a one to five acre zoning district, the Rural Development Five District. Uh, and then uh, those urban growth boundaries that I mentioned before, those are zoned by the county. We've got a couple of different zoning designations in there. Um, some areas are MGA1, which is a one unit per acre zoning district. And then there are some uh, areas in the urban growth boundaries that are currently zoned one unit per five acres. Uh, in addition, we've got an area up in the grassland um, part of the county, kind of the north central area that is zoned suburban infill and conservation. Uh, that's an area where public sewer is, um, is available for the most part. There are a, a few different 
uh, utilities that provide sewer to those areas. And this is uh, kind of a suburban area that allows slightly higher residential densities of about 1.2 uh, units per acre. Uh, we also have some mixed use areas out in the county. Uh, there are four areas that are designated as village. Um, these are Triune, College Grove, Leapers Fork, and Grassland. And these are areas that are surrounded by rural areas, but are you know, mixed use in that they generally consist of a combination of residential and commercial uses. Uh, so in these areas, commercial uses are allowed. Um, in the villages, we've actually done uh, what we call special area plans for each of these four villages where we work with the community to, to develop a long range vision for what those areas should consist of. And then we, for each of these villages, we have a, a tailored set of uh, zoning standards that apply just to these individual villages. Um, and then we have a number of smaller mixed use areas that we call hamlets. These are scattered around and these are basically crossroads um, in the unincorporated county that may have a a smaller mix of commercial and residential oh, uses. Like Arrington, for, for yeah, example. Yeah, that's examples would be Arrington and Rudderville and uh, uh, I guess... Uh, uh, Southall. Yeah, Southall, exactly, yeah, Bethesda. Uh, and then the last zoning district that I'll really mention is the 840 Center Zoning District. This is the broadest zoning district that the county has in that it allows a pretty wide range of uses uh, residential, commercial of various types, and even some light industrial uses, and that's mapped out at uh, the Triune area where 840 intersects uh, with Horton Highway. That's right. Yeah, I guess the interesting thing too is uh, that's the only place we have at 840 Center, even though we do have several other uh, interchanges that are uh, on 840. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, that's that's Very exactly good. right. Well, let me kind of segue into the obvious. Um, you know what? You know uh, we're speaking right now mid-October, and I know just from the permitting standpoint, we've already, the unincorporated county, all but the cities, of course, we've already permitted 400 residential lot, or not lots, but but uh, single family houses. Uh, there is quite the demand to subdivide properties for purposes of uh, development. And what I really want to focus on for the rest of our time here is talk about that process and what do what we look at from both you know from the planning side, but also the engineering side because that's where the essentially the roads, drainage systems, and like that are designed from as mm -hmm. well. But uh, like you said earlier, zoning kind of establishes the minimums and the maximums, but uh, you know subdivision regulations speak to the procedure, and uh, you know we talk about different types of subdivision. We we'll talk about conventional versus conservation and like that. Speak a little bit about that. Yeah, so the, the county allows um, a couple of different type, major types of subdivisions, um, those being traditional subdivisions and conservation subdivisions. Um, this uh, graphic shows uh, kind of what each of those subdivisions generally consist of. Uh, a traditional subdivision, which is on the left, is a subdivision where um, all of the development property is essentially covered by uh, parcels. Um, hmm. There's very little open space typically in these subdivisions. Um, so for instance, if it's in a one unit per acre zoning district, um, the site would be covered with you know, one acre plus lots. And essentially the entire site would be covered in, in building lots. Whereas uh, conservation subdivisions, which are depicted on the right side of the screen, um, are subdivisions where the overall density doesn't change. So it would still be, in this case, a one unit per acre uh, uh, maximum. However, in a conservation subdivision, the individual lots can be smaller than an acre in exchange for leaving large areas of the site as open space. In fact, we require um, at least 50% of the overall development site to remain as open space in conservation subdivisions. Okay. Well, you know, what, one of the interesting things about when evaluating a piece of property from the planning standpoint is, you know, there's certain factors involved. First of all, uh, sewer versus septic, that makes a big difference. I think you've mentioned the, conserva the uh, con conventional subdivisions. It's certainly not mandated conventional subdivisions are on a sewer system. 
or on, or on septic, but that's pretty much how it works out, more likely due to market forces, correct? Uh, that is correct. So in, in a traditional subdivision, you know, we generally see those developed as septic system lots um, because they generally have enough property on the lots to support, you know, a primary and a secondary a soils area for a, se a traditional septic system. Uh, whereas with the smaller lots that we see in conservation subdivisions, um, anything under an, an acre is, is really ineligible for um, a traditional septic system. And so some form of sewer, whether it's public sewer and, and really most often um, non-traditional wastewater systems are used to support those subdivisions. But uh, there's other, you know, water certainly has to be available. Right. Okay. And another factor we look at also is the existing road system, whether the existing road system in the county is deemed to be, through various traffic studies, uh, retains enough capacity for that subdivision to be served. And finally, I guess the, the last factor we look at very carefully, and we'll get into this more when we talk about design, are the, are the natural resources. Uh, you know, we have a, a number of, of resources we want to maintain, and they're maintained slightly differently in, in the different, uh, between a conventional and a, and a conservation subdivision. Yeah. Yeah, and Floyd, you may want to um, talk about how the natural resources are reviewed during either yeah, traditional or conservation. Absolutely. Uh, so a concept plan is, is the stage where we typically are looking at the natural resources and uh, those pretty much dictate a lot of what else ends up going on on the site. When you look at the, the steep slopes, which are very steep is 15 to 25 percent, and then you have greater than 25 percent um, that uh, restricts what can be placed in those areas. Essentially, you, you can't have any building envelopes <clears throat> in certain subdivisions and the slopes greater than uh, 15%. But uh, if it is, then they become engineered site plans, I believe. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, that pretty much restricts a, a lot of what you can do with the building lots. And going back to the conservation uh, versus traditional, the septic, you know, has challenges with drainage as well uh, because your soils areas have to be preserved. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess the other, the other aspect of this too is uh, also there's more than just steep slopes. You know, there's also, you, know, we, you also deal with the floodplains and the waterway natural areas. Uh, and we have been, Actually, since the, uh, since 1980, if my memory serves me correctly, we've been very restrictive on development in the floodplain in the unincorporated county. Yeah, we mentioned that some in the, in the stormwater section is that you can't create lots in the floodplain in a major sub. And then, then of course, in the waterway natural areas also create another areas, be, be it s smaller streams to protect, uh, protect them as well for uh, water. Largely, it is water quality and I would suggest also water quantity as well with those areas because... Uh, it does help. I think it helps a lot in flood control. I think it's one of the best things that we ever did uh, to kind of give those lots more room as far as uh, keep them away from the houses, away from the creek. And we get calls from people in older subdivisions where the creek's starting to meander and getting closer to home and it can cause foundation problems. I see. Also, potentially even flooding problems too. Absolutely. Okay. I was just I was just going to add that that uh, you know I've worked in different places and Floyd has too and you know from my perspective I think our natural resource protection standards are about as strong as any that I've ever seen, and I think we do a real good job of preserving those environmentally sensitive areas. And so I mentioned the the density earlier that you know in a lot a lot of the county can be as much as one unit per acre. Um, however, if a site is, you know, particularly encumbered with natural resources, you know, if there's a lot of floodplain or steep slopes or woodlands or these other things that we protect, then that often results in a yield that's, that's you know, fairly significantly under that one unit per acre. Yeah, you know, I've, I've, I've used my own set of unfortunate analogies in the past. I used to talk about, uh, you know, the table as four legs, you know, when, when evaluating a subdivision. Um, I said this before, a table can't wobble. You have to factor in, you know, you have to factor in, do you have adequate water for, for the number of lots? Do you have adequate wastewater 
treatment, you have an adequate road serving it. And then, of course, the last factor on that has to deal with all the different uh, resources on the property, how one can work uh, work around them and alike. And so it uh, it makes the process... Uh, it's, it's, it's engineering, of course, but it's also rather artful at the same time as well mm-hmm. where you, when you're balancing these competing, uh, these competing interests. So it's pretty important that, uh, you know, in the process we address that. But and I guess, you know, one of the other things we're running into on the conservation is, uh, you know, you would think with, you know, kind of clustering the homes and then having open space would allow you, you know, uh, more options with uh, storm water and have less of an impact. But what we're seeing as far as lot to lot, uh, you know, you get those smaller lots and they're almost totally filled up with house. Mm-hmm. So it makes the drainage issues related to the individual lot uh, much more critical as far as not impacting a neighbor mm-hmm. or, uh, you know, another house down the street. I see. So, but let's talk about the subdivision process in, in general, uh, or in, perhaps in specific, because uh, we have four steps to that, that that you know come through the subdivision regulations. We talk about a, a pre-application conference, a concept plan, a preliminary plat, and a final plat. But let's talk a little bit about pre-application conference. What what are, you know what are we trying to accomplish by sitting down? Because let's say you've got the archetypical 100-acre lot that you've decided you want to. Uh, build houses upon, subdivide, and uh, sell to various builders. Uh, you know, the you know the you know what are we trying to attempt during the pre-application process? What are we trying to uh, what are we trying to accomplish? I should say. Yeah, well, so we we do always require a pre-application meeting before someone is allowed to submit a development proposal to us. And really the purpose of the pre-app meeting is to take a look at what the prospective developer has in mind. Um, Typically they'll have at least a rough layout to show us and it gives us an opportunity to kind of troubleshoot that with the developer. Um, We can identify, you know, maybe areas of the zoning ordinance or stormwater regs or whatever um, we're using that maybe what they're showing us doesn't initially comply with. it also gives us an opportunity to talk to them about the development review and, and approval process. And what we found is that it's, uh, it's a good tool that can um, help streamline that process, that help, help result in a better project, um, and ultimately I think can, can save a developer time and money as well because they get some feedback initially. Mm-hmm. So when we hold those meetings, we always make sure that uh, Floyd or someone from his department is there as well as someone from uh, sewage disposal mm-hmm. if it's a septic subdivision. Sure. And I think it's a good tool that we have. Well, I know, you know, at that, at that level too, we're, we're generally dealing with, you know, published data. We're dealing with, you know, what's what's available to anyone. What is it, you know, uh, classic or, you know, classic or aerial photography where you know where the, where the treat areas are in the site. Now we don't necessarily know how significant those treat areas are by their, their age, for instance, but we also know where the water courses are. And also one thing I think we also attempt to do too is try to at least uh, sensitize the developer that, uh, you know, you have neighbors out there. And, you know, you know, and the idea is we're trying, you know, we're trying through this, particularly in the case of conservation subdivisions, trying to, uh, you know, trying to min- perhaps even minimize the visual impact that project might have on, uh, on the neighbors. Yeah, exactly. And we've actually made some changes to our conservation subdivision standards to, to uh, help with that visual mm-hmm. aspect, providing larger buffers, for instance, mm-hmm. from existing public roads and adjacent properties. And in a pre-application conference, we, we are able to go a little bit beyond just does it appear to meet our regs, Um, That's an opportunity that Floyd and I often will uh, make suggestions on design and layout that maybe aren't necessarily regulation related, but we think will result in a better project. I see. And I know that you, you, you have the back and forth too, you know, like you said earlier, a conventional subdivision at the bare minimums typically can be one acre lots. And there's an argument out there that that's uh, better accepted by the community, depending on the neighborhood, of course. But also, when we talk about conservation subdivisions, which typically occur in, in conjunction with sewered lots, too, there are certain things, you know, I think 
Yeah, there's certain trade-offs. You know, Floyd's already spoken to the fact that on a micro level, conservation subdivisions perhaps challenge drainage on the you know, between and through the individual lots, but also uh, on a macro level, because the lots aren't as big, you have less road uh, to tell you there's less road constructed, which contributes uh, a, to another brand of stormwater issue. Shorter, you know, shorter runs of roads that all ultimately have to be maintained by uh, the county highway department once accepted as part of the county road system and the like. So, um, and you this, can also get into the uh, ditch section roadway versus curb section roadway as well if the lots are, you know, uh, of a certain size, especially on on septic. A lot of times we have a ditch section road, which you know, for stormwater quality, can make it, it easier for them to comply with the ordinance without having to have a lot of additional, you know, structures like uh, the bioretention ponds and things like that. Whereas your, uh, you know, conservation and, and cluster type developments, you know, you may have uh, opportunities for buffers, especially with the waterway natural areas, but. With the uh, you know with the density of the homes and with the uh, with the curb section roadways going into pipes and then coming out headwalls, a lot of times those will require maybe some additional treatment yeah. before they get in the creek. Yeah, well, that's you know, but what you describe is what we talked about a little earlier. There's a there's a certain art to subdivision design. You you know, as far as it's essentially uh, an episode of uh, balancing. Uh, Balancing sometimes competing uses or competing uh, values, you know, where you And that's, are, yeah, definitely the case in the septic type subdivisions, traditional where, uh, you know, like I said, you have to worry about the soils areas. So you got more room, but you're kind of restricted as far as where you can put things after you site all the septic systems. Mm -hmm. That particular drainage seems to be one that uh, that bedevils us at times, you know, I'm uh, but let's let's move away from that. Let's talk about what happens. What what is it, what happens with a concept plan? That's the first step of the development. Okay, I guess that you know concept plan characterize it. It depicts a site layout that is based on what we know about the property vis a vis the resources, vis a vis the zoning, vis a vis all the things that we we have in there. Could you talk briefly to that, Mike? Yeah. So uh, a concept plan is the first stage. So that's the first thing that they will actually formally submit to the county for review and approval, and really it's also the most important stage um, because that's really where the overall subdivision is, is um, presented and, and depicted and ultimately approved. Um, and once it's approved, it becomes vested for a period of time. And so um, really we do a great deal of uh, analysis at the, con at the concept plan stage um, and that's where we'll really review the development for compliance with not only the zoning ordinance, but with the stormwater regs, with our traffic requirements, um, wastewater, and so forth, to make sure that uh, it complies with, with all of the regulations that the county has adopted. Um, the subsequent stages are important too, but they're all based upon the approved concept plan, and so that's, that's really the, the, the most important stage in the process. And it's also the stage in the process where I think the public can have the most involvement and, and influence. Uh, in that um, that's when uh, the public hearing would occur if one is required. Uh, we require a public hearing for any subdivision that contains 50 or more lots. And so that public hearing would take place, does take place at the concept plan stage. Um, and that's a good opportunity for people to you know, get involved and, and understand what is being proposed and, and uh, understand how it's being reviewed and analyzed by the county I see. Well, also, too, at that, at that stage, too, you, you also have to remind, too, that uh, planning commission, per se, is, in essence, implementing a set of regulations. Right. It's not, uh, you know, the, uh, I, feel, I feel like there's many, you know, the, a lot of times they'll be looking at a project and they may not like certain aspects of design, but if it's, if it's, compl if it's compliant, then it gets pretty difficult to tell somebody that you can't do that particular subdivision. Yeah. Yeah, that's a real good point, and, and I think a lot of people don't quite understand mm -hmm. how that works. Um, and, and you're right, the Planning Commission doesn't have a lot of latitude if a development proposal uh, meets the requirements. And so that's why um, the comprehensive plan is so important, mm -hmm. um, because that's the, that's the official policy document that is adopted by the county that sets the stage for what the zoning becomes 
and ultimately what the rules are that development has to follow. And the Planning Commission has a lot of uh, influence in terms of what that comprehensive plan looks like. Um, but once the zoning is established and someone proposes a development that meets those rules, um, the Planning Commission looks at it very objectively um, and, and looks at it, you know, in, in essence, from the standpoint of does it meet the criteria that have been uh, adopted. Well, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to leave this topic without making this point, too. It's just, you know, involvement by the neighborhood, even though the Planning Commission has limited ability, can make a difference. I've seen it on countless projects right. where the neighbors were able to, you know, convince the developer, hey, could you widen this buffer or could you... Could you look at this, you know, could look at different things to try to, you know, they may not necessarily uh, be looking forward to the, the, to the uh, what, however number of lots they're having next door, but at least they have an opportunity to influence design elements and things that would make it uh, a better fit yeah, to their, exactly. their lifestyles. And, and even if a public hearing isn't required, there are still ways that people can become aware and, and uh, provide comments. Um, we post agendas on the website. We're going to be starting to post a lot more information in terms of the, the plans themselves and staff reports and that sort of thing. So there, there are and will continue to be improved opportunities for the public to learn about development that's taking place. And then even when there's not a public hearing, they have the ability to provide written comments. And then we're also always willing to, to meet with citizens and, and discuss projects with that's them. That's a good point. That's a good point. Well, the next stage is preliminary plat stage, and uh, that's where I guess we go from uh, th this this idea this is conceptually into the concrete, and that's where Floyd's office becomes more and more important because that's when the construction plans for the roads, drainage features, and the like are submitted. Now, yeah, that's where we get a full set of grading and drainage plans, roadway profiles to show that they're meeting all the criteria, and then a pretty healthy drainage uh, calculation set to do all the stormwater control. I see, I see. And again, that too is reviewed by the Planning Commission. Now there's not a public hearing aspect to that. Right. And again, they are looking to uh, ultimately the compliance on that uh, of the, re the regulations and also whether or not the applicant is not only following the uh, specifications contained within the subdivision regulations, and there are a few, but also we like to see that not only the letter, but also the spirit of how those regulations were put into place as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, from at a preliminary plat stage, I guess, you know, we do see some amount of minor shifting uh, based on what we actually find in the field. I know, Floyd, can you can speak to this better than anybody, you know, uh, Karst features, sinkholes, they have a tendency sometimes not to be found until someone starts. Yeah, when they get out and start clearing trees and moving dirt, they'll uh, often run into things they didn't anticipate. And hopefully, you know, we can accommodate those with little shifts in the in the uh, roadway or the, the other features uh, without getting into, you know, uh, having to move lots or having to lose lots. And if, if things change too drastically, they, they may have to go back to concepts. Right. But it is possible to lose lots at that stage because mm -hmm. uh, after all, the concept plan sets the broad parameters. You know, you can't bring in a, uh, use around numbers, a hundred lot concept plan and say, well, after we designed it, we decided we could get 101. No, you hundred, the concept plan sets the parameters that ultimately sets up the ultimate uh, uh, resolution of the subdivision. Now, once the preliminary plat's approved, we have um, the final plat. And at the final plat stage, uh, I know that that's essentially, I would say, creates a survey document that lots are ultimately uh, ultimately conveyed upon. But there's more to it than that. For instance, uh, you know, I think Tennessee state law require, requires that, you know, in order to put a final plat down, that you either A, complete all the improvements, or B, bond those improvements. And uh, generally speaking, uh, that sets off a whole other process. Most projects are bonded. And like we didn't, I guess, forgot to mention that after preliminary, they can get a land disturbance permit and actually yeah. start constructing uh, the subdivision. So yeah, final plat, if they're not done, which they never are, unless it's maybe a large lot easement subdivision, they would have to, you know, with their performance agreements place, uh, you know, surety to guarantee that they're gonna complete those improvements. See, 
I see. Well, this has been kind of a, uh, you know, I think we've hit all the high points of the development process, but I'd like to give you all an opportunity to talk a little bit about, you know, you know, some of the things we, we've discussed uh, as far as what we were seeking to do when new subdivisions come in. Yeah, you know, ultimately we're, at, at this stage, um, we are primarily making sure that a proposed development meets the criteria of the zoning ordinance and other regulations. We're kind of always in the process of looking at either our long-range plan, like mm -hmm. the comprehensive plan, um, and determining whether our policies ought to uh, be altered or remain the same. We're in that process currently. Or we're in the process of, of looking at our regulations to see if they need to be modified based on what we're seeing in the field and the result that we're seeing on the ground. Um, uh, or we're always in the, in the process of reviewing a subdivision or a other development for compliance with the set of regulations. So it's kind of a fluid process. Boy, can you add anything? Yeah, I mean, I guess given the, the developers, obviously, obviously their desire for maximizing their lots, uh, you know, we rarely get an ideal design, but we want to at least, you know, have that compromise where we get one that obviously meets the ordinance and, and makes people, you know, somewhat happy and want to live there. Hmm. Well, what I'd like to say before we close this particular uh, episode out, I'd like to say that uh, we are always available to talk to public you know, you, you, we can talk to public about this process, whether it's tied to a specific uh, specific development or just the the process in general. Because Mike alluded to it earlier, you know, there this something of this is kind of a classic feedback loop. You know, everyone involved, planning commission, county commission, who adopts many of these rules, you know, we 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 see this, we see the outcomes we want, but sometimes it takes someone telling us or reminding us how this might have happened. And so to that extent, uh, I would urge anyone interested in this process to contact the planning office or the engineering office and talk about their concerns, again, whether they are uh, due to a specific project or uh, due to just in general. We're always there. We're there at 8 to 430. And we always can take the time to speak with you. But at any rate, that ought to bring us to a close of this particular episode of Community Development 101. Uh, again, thank you, Mike Madison, for being here, and Floyd Heflin for joining us as well. And we look forward to seeing you in a future episode. Thank you very much.